Well, I guess the place to start is 1978, when there was a popular revolution in Afghanistan. It was uh, run by uh, Taraki and Amin, uh, and it basically overthrew the old feudal leadership. Uh, and they, they, policy was based on modernizing the country. They wanted to industrialize. They wanted land reform. They wanted educational reform. It was a very progressive uh, new administration. And it's interesting to look at the accounts at the time in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. They all admitted how popular this new government was. The Times, for example, says that foreign journalists in Kabul are surprised to find that, quote, nearly every Afghan they interviewed said they were delighted with the coup. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, the people were, were uh, very, very enthusiastic. Uh, the Washington Post, the same thing. This modernist government uh, wants to have reforms that include women and minorities. So across the board, there was this sense of real optimism inside of Afghanistan. Uh, but the people who were concerned were two groups. One was the Islamic extremists inside Afghanistan, the ones we call the Mujahideen. These were religious zealots. And they hated the fact that women were being educated. They hated the modernization. They hated the pro-socialist orientation of the new government, and they hated the fact that it was a non-religious government. And so they began to mobilize. The other group that hated this was the Americans and their allies, the British and uh, some of the others. And they were upset that this government was pro-Soviet. In fact, the Soviet Union had not supported uh, um, Taraki and Amin when they staged the coup. The Soviets, even though the other government was anti-Soviet, they were on friendly terms with it. So they weren't behind the coup. And Cyrus Vance, Secretary of State, says there was no sign of Soviet involvement in the coup. But the Americans in the Carter administration who were making policy, decided that they could use this against the Soviet Union. And so Brzezinski was the driving force in, of, in wanting to back the Mujahideen. Carter himself was opposed initially. He did, didn't like these Islamic zealots and didn't want to get in bed with them. But Brzezinski had no hesitation. And so Brzezinski started to work with the CIA to get funding for this Mujahideen. Then finally, on July 3rd, Carter signs the memo authorizing funding for the Mujahideen and, and support for the Mujahideen. Brzezinski writes a memo that day to Carter saying that uh, this act now is going to force the Soviet Union to invade. Why did Brzezinski think the Soviet Union was going to invade? Publicly, yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second, but Brzezinski knew that the Soviets were very paranoid about the 40 million uh, Muslims in Central Asia who were part of the Soviet Union. So the United States begins to work money from Saudi Arabia and the United States, training camps in Pakistan. Uh, so the United States is working with the Zia government to train people, to arm them, to recruit them, and to propagandize them as these holy warriors, the jihadis. The thing that has to be understood is that the people we were supporting were, uh, were going in there shooting and killing teachers and skinning them alive for teaching women. That was the ones the United States was supporting in 1978, 1979. And true to form, there was a debate inside the Politburo, and most of the military and political leaders said, um, don't invade, don't, don't send in troops. The government in Kabul was asking the Soviets to send in troops. But the government in Moscow did not want to do that. However, finally, Brezhnev sees the situation, uh, understands that if the Soviets invade, it's going to probably mean the end of detente, 
the end of Saw II, canceling the meeting that was planned between Carter and Brezhnev. But Brezhnev says, we have to do it. It's going to take three or four weeks and we'll be out of there. Of course, it's going to take them a decade. They got bogged down there. So, and then when Soviets invade, publicly, Brzezinski is saying, this is terrible. And Carter is saying, this is the worst thing that's happened since World War II, uh, the worst crisis that we faced. People had to remind him in the press that there was the Korean War, that there was <clears throat> the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, that there was Vietnam. Uh, but, but Carter is saying this is the worst thing that's happened. And then he issues the Carter Doctrine, saying that if the Soviets or anybody interferes with the Middle East, this is going to lead to basically nuclear war. And so Carter, who had started off as a progressive president by the last two years, had been completely captured by Brzezinski and the reactionaries. And Carter's last two years in office, as good, a, as good an ex-president as he's been, he was a terrible president the last two years. The great big military buildup, big Cold War confrontational stance, not only there, but also in Iran. Uh, so, so, but, but the important thing to know is that the people we were supporting were anti-democratic, anti-popular, and uh, anti-women, anti-modernizing. And so Carter begins this. Then Reagan, of course, doubles down on it. And under Reagan, this, the biggest CIA operation to that point was the covert war in Afghanistan. Three billion dollars the U.S. spent. And we began creating these schools. We were arming and training these jihadis. And they came in from all over the Middle East and other parts of the Muslim world. Uh, and among those were Osama bin Laden, al-Zawahiri, people who later become the Taliban, people who later become al-Qaeda, people who later become ISIS, were armed, trained, and propagandized by the United States. Uh, with its allies in MI6 and others. Uh, and they were using textbooks that were written by the University of Nebraska in Omaha. They said the Center for Afghan Studies there at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, was getting money from the U.S. Agency for International Development to write these textbooks that were used to train people, even to teach kids how to read. You have to go back again when the when Amin took over in 1978, the New York, uh, he says, uh, this is, uh, this is a, things look bright for Afghanistan, for the future. The New York Times had a column, uh, an article saying things don't look bright. Look at what's happening in Afghanistan. The average, uh, the GDP, per capita GDP is $70, $70 a year. So we're talking about 20 cents a day people were living on. The average life expectancy was 40 years. The uh, literacy rate was 10%. Uh, the New York Times commented, uh, the little has changed. People live in these mud villages behind high walls as they did 2000 years ago when Alexander the Great came through. And so that's the country we, we were gonna you know, undermine basically. Uh, because the State Department says in 1979, it's in America's interest, even though it's going to hurt reform in Afghanistan, even though it's going to hurt the people there, it's in our interest to oppose the Soviet Union. And so we do. And we drag the Soviets down. Uh, and we tie them down. We do everything we can. And we create these books that were used to train people. And they would show, teach kids how to read. And they would teach them how to count, uh, count dead Soviet soldiers. Uh, Kalashnikovs, uh, mines, mortars, that was being used to teach the kids how to count and how to read these images. And when the Taliban takes over in 1996, they use the same textbooks. They only take out the pictures of human beings. They thought that pictures of human beings were blasphemous, but otherwise they use the same textbooks that the U.S. had provided. And so we create this nightmare situation there. Uh, and, uh, and so that continues after the Soviets are out. When Gorbachev comes to power, he wants to get out immediately. He was opposed to this. But the United States and the Saudis and the Brits do everything they can to tie the Soviets down longer. 
finally, in February of 1988, Gorbachev announces that the Soviets were going to begin their withdrawal. It begins in May. It takes them 10 months to withdraw. So 10 months to withdraw. They finally are out in 1989. Uh, and then, uh, so then during the, but after that, the U.S. loses interest. And so without any interest of what's happening there, uh, the, the, then the Civil War continues. It's the Northern, the Northern Alliance versus the Taliban. And the U.S. had an interest in supporting both sides because the U.S. was working with the Taliban in order to create, to, to support Unical's pipeline. Because the, there was this fantasy about the Central Asia and Afghanistan, which had gone back for 100 years. If you go back in the reports in the New York Times and other places, in the early 1900s, they're talking about the mineral wealth and the oil wealth in Afghanistan throughout Central Asia. So Unical began to develop that wealth. Uh, and the, let me see if I can find that here. Uh, it's, it's interesting, the US policy, uh, because the people we were supporting there were very, very backward uh, and very reactionary. So, uh, so I did. So I studied the Omaha newspapers to, in order to see what they were saying about uh, the University of Nebraska's involvement. And the Omaha World Herald reported that the Northern Alliance, the good guys, this is what it says about them, said that, that it's been cr criticized by the U.S. State Department, the United Nations, and human rights groups for terrorism, rape, kidnapping of women and children, torture of prisoners, and indiscriminate killing of civilians during battles. But those were the good guys, and they were the ones who were fighting the Taliban. And so the United States is up to its eyeballs in responsibility for the Taliban coming into effect and uh, going to power. And apparently the CIA had a lot of ties to them, as did uh, Unical and other American corporations looking for that. So, uh, but the United States officially has little interest and the Taliban takes over in 1996 and imposes a totally repressive regime there in which women were not allowed to go to schools. Women were not allowed to go out without escorts. Women uh, could be married at any age uh, uh, against their will. Uh, the, the strict, the strict laws of people were caught stealing. There would be public amputations in the town squares. Just totally repressive government. So, um, and so that, and so that's the situation uh, up to 1991. I mean, up to 2001 and 9/11 uh, and the U.S. involvement.